Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of The Final Bar. Today, we feature a conversation with Jeff Hirsch. Jeff is the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac. It's a book I received for a number of years, and it was a pleasure to sit down with him, talk about his process, how he thinks about seasonality, trend following, stock picking, all those things, uh, and uh, share some of his ideas about how to incorporate seasonality in your thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to today's show on Thursday, November 14th. This is Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Not coming at you from Redmond today. We're actually uh, on the road this week in New York um, doing some media interviews on Bloomberg TV and elsewhere. So in lieu of doing a live show, we thought we would share some of the discussions we had with some of the great experts down at the Las Vegas Traders Expo last week. And one of my favorite conversations was with Jeff Hirsch. Jeff, I've known for a number of years, and I've gotten his Stock Traders Almanac for longer than I can remember. I think it was one of the first things I, I got probably in 2002, 2003, as I was learning technical analysis and learning market history. Um, got to know Jeff over, over time and have enjoyed uh, picking his brain in this conversation for sure. So Jeff uh, is the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac. His father, Yale Hirsch, actually started it decades and decades ago. He's now in his 90s. Jeff took it over from him a number of years ago. I've never, I don't believe I've ever met Yale, but I've enjoyed uh, hearing stories of Yale's work from uh, from his son, Jeff. Jeff is also now in a money management role. So they, they work with uh, the probabilities funds and apply their seasonal trend following techniques to uh, money management. So interesting, he kind of touches on that a little bit. But what I like the most about what uh, he discusses two things. Number one is just the general approach to seasonality and how cycles and seasonal trends don't occur in a vacuum. It's also very important to look at trends and think about trend following in relationship to those uh, seasonal trends, the seasonal cycles. And the second big thing was just the idea of stock picking, this process of combining technical analysis with other inputs. I think that's something that hopefully will resonate with many of you with your own portfolio. So here, I'd like to share uh, my interview with Jeff Hurst from the Las Vegas Traders Expo last week. Here we go. Hey, everyone. We're sitting down today with Jeff Hirsch. He's the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac and the chief market strategist for the Probabilities Funds. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Great to what be with you. What a pleasure to sit down with you. It is. Followed your work for years and years. Used to get your newsletter. Absolutely love the, the idea of seasonality, cyclicality, and that nature of the markets. How do you, can you just describe a little bit about what your investment approach is? Someone asks you, what's the almanac methodology? How would you yeah, describe it? Yeah, I mean, it? we get sort of compartmentalized into the seasonal cycles, patterns area, but we're yeah. much more than that. Okay. That's just a, a starting point. It's a foundation for us. That's where our roots are. But yeah. we use five big disciplines, fundamentals, technicals, seasonals, of course, psychology, market sentiment, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, geopolitics and monetary policy. So Got it. it's not just seasonality. Yeah. And there's a lot of technical analysis in there. Um, I can read a chart. <laughs> and I had a new stock screen. I can find support. Even without some sort of Bollinger Band or pivot point, I can show yeah. you where some support and consolidation there you or go. gap might be. That's yeah. the stuff I learned from my father when I started the business way back. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about that? How did you kind of get started? What kind of brought you to this point where you're... It was, uh, well, you know, I was born, bred, weaned, raised on the thing. Yeah. Uh, my father started the business in 66, the year I was born. Got it. Uh, came out with the first almanac in 67. Uh, okay. It was about a year and change. That was the 68 book. And this is your father, <laughs> Gail Hirsch, Gail Hirsch. Right? Yep. He's 96. Wow. He was 96 uh, last month. Yep. Um, still kind of knows where the day he gets his New York Times every day. No and, kidding. Uh, had him play some show tunes on the piano at the <laughs> him and mom are both at the nursing home together. Yeah. So he's not sure if he had lunch or not, but he can play Melancholy Baby on the piano. Good still, for him. You know? Good for him. Um, so I used to, you know, look at charts in my pajamas with dad around the house and yeah, stuff yeah. and shipping the books uh, out of our house with the business, you know, uh, running out of the garage basically or converted the old garage. So 
one of my jobs, you know, there's work in the mailroom. I started, I started the mailroom, you know? Perfect. Then I went to running numbers. Um, not the bookie types of numbers, just the running numbers, the calculations. Okay. Okay, good, good. I do this little motion with my hand because we used to do it on an adding machine <laughs> oh, and graph paper. Yep. yep. And then you know, um, I was in between things after yeah. school. Yep. I was landscaping and trying to do anything but work for my father and right. my uh, my best friend Keith. He said, Jeff, what are you doing? Go work for your father. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Luckily, when I said okay and I started there, there was a certain connection and a lot of people that dad worked with over the years didn't always get his his angle okay. of looking at patterns and seasonalities and markets and cycles. And probably a bit of genetics there um, and some osmosis and you know environmental ex exposure throughout the years. But okay. that's one thing I got uh, mm. from him. And I was able to click with that. And then all that calculation stuff that I did by hand and graph paper, I converted it to Excel for DOS wow. back in 92. I'm no computer that's, whiz, that's awesome. but I just had to come up with a way to, to track it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. it was the data was getting longer and longer, you know? It, we were building on it. Yeah. Now it's in a database, of course, and we, yep. we have all sorts of searchable things. And we constantly create new screens, whether it's, you know, presidential election years where there's a Republican running for re-election and a Democratic, you know, House and a Republican Senate, you know, those different right. iterations. Right, right, right. Put those things in there. And um, I started with them in 1990. Okay. And, um, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. We've learned a lot over the years. We've built yeah. on what he's done. So it's, uh, it's kind of a privilege. It's a great journey. So starting in 1992, you know, 2019, what's changed in terms of the process, the approach, or even just the overall environment? What, you know, what, what has changed in terms of how you try to win the game here? Well, I mean, SQL Server uh, database is a, is a it changed a lot. It made us, yep. uh, it's capable of doing a lot more. Yeah. Um, we've added some things uh, together, mm -hmm. uh, some indicators. Some things have dropped by the wayside that don't actually exist anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. society changes. I mean, that, that's what we measure with seasonality is the repetitive behaviors of, of society, yeah. cultural um, maneuverings of people in, in mass. Right. That's why you know people pay their bills at the beginning of the month. That's why you see these month, these end, month end strains. There's things that happen in quarterly periods, year ends, because people are doing things. The whole sell a man go away or best six months fishing strategy is because people are doing different things in the summer. That's right. You know? Yep. Yep. So we've also compared different time frames. Instead mm. of running everything, you know, this is what the S&P's done since 1950. We look at since 1950, since 71, because that's when NASDAQ started. Mm. Okay. Since 88, because that's mm. post-87 crash when yep. we had the systemic changes. And then right. we look at the most recent, like, 20, 21 year period for Got a it. lot of our different patterns and seasonalities. And then I'll also go look in there and see when something changes, you know, if, if uh, something flipped where, you know, triple witching had a different behavior starting around 91, then mm. something's changed there. You, you yeah. don't always necessarily know exactly what caused it, um, but if it's there, it's there. Yeah. Now, when you're, you know, maybe from the, the, the Stock Traders Almanac newsletter, for example, mm -hmm. using all of those different inputs, that's a lot of different things, fundamental, technical, seasonal. How do you reconcile all those, especially when they disagree? What if the cycle's telling you one thing, but the chart might be telling you something different? How do you reconcile the disagreement if the setup, between them? If the setup's not there, yeah. you know, uh, and it's not tracking the seasonal properly, yeah. we'll, we'll take a pass. Got it. Okay. You know, or, yep. or pick a buy limit below the market. If it gets back into, if it comes back to trend or, yeah. you know, reverts to the mean. Yeah. Um, but we do use all the stuff to create portfolios in the newsletter. And we also mm. use it to pick stocks. We yep. just put out a new stock basket, fundamentally screened, mm. which is such a a deep screen. We use Zach's research wizard for okay. the fundamentals. Sure. Um, and it's growth, acceleration of growth, valuations, and, you know, it's just sort of not outperforming the S&P, not underperforming. It's just sort of sitting yeah. there waiting to, ha to happen but for the numbers that are coming through the um, the quarterly reports and, yeah. and then the filings to come through. And then we look for stocks that are underfollowed yeah. within that you know, that basket underfollowed by Wall Street. Right. So all things being equal, one stock is followed by 20 analysts, one's followed by five analysts, we're gonna go home but followed by five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we look at, we take, we, we boil 8,000 stocks down to about 100 or 150 or 50, depending on how it falls. Yep. And then we go into the charts. Mm. Um, we'll use stock charts, we'll use uh, some other software. Uh, IBD's Market Smith, I like too. Sure. Um, 
and we'll just pick out the ones that look great and then right. look for our buy limits and, and and unlike a lot of other services we have specific buy limits and stop losses and mm. with some of our sectors seasonal work we have some targets okay but for the most part if the stock keeps going up well, why sell it right you right know? right you know <laughs> right. let your winners ride man that makes so much sense but how often do people not do exactly what you just said oh right? my god yeah. i mean friends of mine that i talked to about stocks and I'm like we t i told you to sell that it's like <laughs> Like, hello, you know, you got to listen. And, yeah. and I'm no better sometimes. I mean, yeah, we, yeah, have, yeah. we have a, for the fund that we help run, yeah. if a prime broker, it's yeah. much better giving the instructions to, to somebody else and having them execute it. That's right. Because That's right. if you have to do it yourself, you're like, well, wait a second. I'm going to try to get it for another penny cheaper or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I want to sell it up a little higher. Right. You got to just check the emotions at the door. That's right. <laughs> really, it's hard. It's the hardest. It's, it's the biggest battle for anyone in the market. So, do you have any techniques or any strategies that you use to try to remove the emotional component or minimize the emotional component? How do you how do you do that when we're so wired to make poor decisions? Sometimes, do you have any strategies or any ways that you try to you know focus on the data? Focus on you know, it's it's old school reminder stuff. I mean, the stuff yeah. pinned on the wall. You know, yeah, right. There's right. moments of of weakness yeah. and. Uh, existential trading crises that, that we remember yes. like remember that time october 2011 when you were away at your sister-in-law's <laughs> wedding right and the market was and wait a second we've got stop loss just you know yeah it's or okay. or uh we were leaving the money show one may mm. and we wanted to sell something before we got on the plane and it was 2015, I think it was. It okay. was a great, and it was like a total seasonal sell, and yes. we just didn't pull the trigger. So a couple mm. of points that you remember, you know, the, yep. the path to success is a series of steps from failure to failure. Yes. So you have to remember, and in the Almanac, right. yeah. we have, you know, you're in, if, if you don't profit from your investment mistakes, somebody else will. Right. You got to got to write them down. <laughs> Performance and recommendations. It's fantastic. You know, I mean, fantastic. it's 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 part of the whole thought process. Yes. And the other basic technique, it's as I said before, let somebody else trade it. Mm, you right, know, if right. you can, yeah. or just, I mean, stick to your number. Yeah. And with stop losses, we don't put them in there okay. for people to see. Yeah. It's a, yep. it's a, you know, a, a, an alert stop loss. Okay. Sure. So if our stock closes below our stop loss, mm -hmm. it gets sold the next trading day. Got it. Got it. So do you have a regular process or routine to go back and review successful or maybe unsuccessful trades? Do you have a normal way that you go back and, and review what worked and maybe what didn't? Or, or how do you sort of evaluate your performance besides just looking at the well, performance we, I of, mean, the, of the bat bucket? This stuff that you learn over the years, I mean, there's not a particular way that I go and evaluate. I mean, if, yeah. this, if, this, if the stock doubles, we sell half yeah. and let our winnings ride and put the rest back to work. Right. If it falls below the stop loss that we picked from seeing that support level on a chart, yes. <clears throat> we're out. Right. Maybe it's a pivot point. Maybe it's a moving average. Maybe it's a gap. Maybe it's yeah. a some low that we'll want, you know, that, yeah. that we'll want to not break through. Yep. Um, so the trades get evaluated every month. I mean, we're looking at the stocks. Uh, yeah. I, I try not to get too much into the stories anymore, okay. yep. which a lot yep. of people do, and you see that on the, the news shows a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just looking for numbers, and yep. I, want, I want stuff, you know, like Ariston Networks, which just was got knocked down again. That was a stock yeah. we had a bunch of years ago. Came Ooh. through our screens, made a lot of, upside gain on it yep. and then it hit our stop and we're out that's have it. a look back at it if it that's comes great. through the screens again yeah it will Consider be it again i mean that's 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 what we found works is this yeah. kind of a combination of fundamentals and the, the big thing with the stocks also is the time of year okay we're not sure. a, we're not a stock of the month newsletter right, right. we're going to be we put on a new basket in october yep. we're going to work that basket we it. put out some defensives in june with dividends we worked that for a while you know, Got and it. there's some other opportunities to come in there. We've got some other trading strategies. There's the only free lunch on Wall Street. Right. You know, bargain stocks making new 52-week <laughs> lows in December. What a great year for that last year. We had That's the right. big sell-off. That's right. We had 1,500 stocks making new lows on triple witching Friday and, wow. and or quadruple witching Friday, if you want. Yep. What do you think of quadruple witching Friday? Is, is it is there any influence of single stock futures? I, don't, I mean, I don't why, know. Why I mean, do I have to call it quadruple witch? <laughs> Nobody right? trade single stock features. No one does. I don't think you need to. Skip that. Someone corrected me. Like, yeah. All right, I'll call I it the quad okay. witch. So here we are in early November. You know, mm -hmm. you sort of alluded to what 
you know, what's happening in the markets. You know, the, the S&P continues to go to new highs. Things that have not really been working yet, like financials now starting to break out and go higher. Um, uh, defensive things like utilities and real estate that had been in a position of strength starting to roll over a little bit. What is your work, what is your process telling you about you know, going into year end, it's, heading into next year? First of all, these things that just happened are so yeah. seasonal, it, it, mm. it, it, it blows me away. I mean, yeah. seasonals don't work perfectly every year. This year yeah. they're working like a champ it's great. and a charm. Yep. And we got out of our utilities and defensives and bonds that we've been getting into for April, May, June. Right. And then again, we got out of everything and it, it, or we had our sell signal for Dow at S&P May 1st, mm. our seasonal sell signal using MACD. Right. And then July was, July 19th was NASDAQ. So we were prepared for that. And we had our buy signal yeah. October 11th. So mm -hmm. anything that was left over in the defensive baskets was moved out and yep. we went Diamonds, spiders, cubes, IWMs, you mm. know, the ETFs, as well as all the sectors, the financials, uh, tech, biotech, all that stuff. We went in there. So to me, it just, it, it was like teed up for us. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what happens seasonally every year. These stocks, mm. these sectors tend to come into the strength around October. If you look right. at the, the sector seasonality um, yeah. calendar in the book, there's this cluster in October where all these sectors, the ones you're talking about, some of the others, come into their bullish season. Right. It's according to the playbook. That's great. It is. It's fantastic. And, and it's set up technically. It's set yes. up fundamentally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing with MACD. You yep. know, people, you know, moving average, convergence, divergence, I'm assuming people here uh, know what that is. Yeah. But even the originator, and I'm, and I'm pretty friendly with Marvin Appel, Jerry's, okay. Jerry's son, the, sure. the guy who created, you know, the same, another father-son generation. Yeah, yeah, that's thing. right. And, you know, Marvin's done some different things there, and we, we have some, some good chats about it. But yeah. the thing with MACD is it's not there to just use in a vacuum. Yeah. It's a confirm of an entry or an exit or a buy or a sell. So yeah. we use it to confirm as Cy Harding, remember, right, Cy Harding? Ryan of the Bear? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Cy's the one who came up with that. I and mean, his hmm. name's still in our book. He took yeah, Appel's yeah. MACD, laid it on top of our best and worst six-month switching strategy. Right. Dubbed it the best mechanical system ever. Yeah, He yeah. was right, and we yeah. use it. We've, Keeps working. We've done some new wrinkles to it where we're looking for confirm across Dallas and be a NASDAQ on the yep. MACD buy. Yep. And the one that you, everyone thinks 1226.9, we use an 8179. Yeah. On the buy side, 1226 for the sell. Got it. It's the whole rationale for that but yeah. um you know we just see these things happening regularly yeah and it's a confirmation that we're, we're probably moving higher yeah and you, you alluded to that a little bit earlier right and i've always i loved when you when you've written about that in the almanac and elsewhere that you know the, the seasonal trends sort of the may to november kind of traditional you know stronger versus weaker part of the year but validating that with the macd which really confirms that that's playing out right so can just play the calendar, that's sort of like the amateurish level, I would say, but waiting for some confirmation from like MACD really validates that, that the trends are, are reversed. And, and we're, are we're tracking the, the economic numbers as well. I mean, we have yeah. what we call market at a glance in the newsletter. Okay, yep. It's the five disciplines, seasonal, yep. psychological, fundamental, technical, and monetary. Monetary yes. includes a little geopolitics in there yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. But Yep. Um, but now we got the Fed off our back, and right. <laughs> it looks like we're having tea with China. You know, can we get a dumpling in there? Can we okay, get like a, right? a little dim sum or something? <laughs> Kung Fu Panda action. So recently you've added, I think, to or, or augmented what you've done with the Almanac and, and transitioned into a little more of a money management role sort of thing. Can you talk about that transition sure. and what you've learned well, from it that? Wasn't, it wasn't just me. We've learned a lot yeah. there, and we did a whole strategy review and revamp of it okay. earlier in, in 2019. Yeah. Uh, my, our partner, Joe Childry, founded it. Um, he was a broker branch manager at Wells Fargo, AG Edwards. I probably shipped books out to him when I was, you know, he's got a couple years on me, but I shipped them out to Ben. We used to sell like, you know, a couple thousand, 2,500 almanacs to right. AG Edwards. They put their catalog. He had one on his desk every year, a gift from Ben Edwards. Yep. One year, he's going to an uh, African safari trip, leaving from the office, you know, bucket list trip. I think he might even want it for me, the producer. Right. Nothing to read. Grabs the almanac off the conference room table, takes it with him on a flight, three weeks in Africa, reads it, becomes a trend following convert, <laughs> comes back, <laughs> trades it for his own account, right. trades it for client's account, uh. then in a, Got together with a math PhD, created a strategy based upon a lot of stuff in there, okay. added a few other wrinkles to it, and started a hedge fund in 08. Was up 
five and two point two eight or five and a quarter percent roughly wow. in two thousand eight, and that was net of two and twenty hedge fund fees. Wow, um, decent performance. Fast forward, he converted to a forty act fund mm -hmm. uh, in late 2013, 2014. Yeah, <clears throat> VIT also, so you can trade it in a, a tax deferred annuity, right? As well as a. a mutual fund mm -hmm. and that's when he brought me in. He was buying almanacs to give to advisors yeah. from Wiley and there was a promotion, you know, buy 500 almanacs, get a free webinar with Jeff. Ah. So he did that, but he, he had his sights on me for a while. Yeah. We actually met first at the Money Show in San Francisco, I think it was 2014, Okay. Um, late 2014. And we started consulting, and then we came on board. I brought my director of research, Christopher Mistel, the guy who put all this stuff on, you know, it's like Yale's brain on drugs or something <laughs> right. like that, you know, on, on, in, in, in silicon, silicon or whatever, you know. Right, right. Um, so Chris and I came in, you know, a couple of years ago, and then with the meltdown last fall, mm -hmm. We really closed ranks with, with Joe and came in f like really full time and That's did great. a whole revamp of the strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, w he enabled us and we enabled him to, to use the new research that we've been doing. Yeah. To compare the different time frames I was mentioning earlier. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the different personalities of each month, you know. Yep. The beginning and end of each month is not necessarily the same, but, you know, August is a little different, December is a little different. You know, you've got particular points in the calendar that sure. have or high conviction days with you know frequency and magnitude of gains together yep. or losses. Yep. yep. So we go That's short. Right. Okay. Mostly, you know, go to cash during those week times or mm -hmm. not cash, market neutral. Market neutral position. Right. Got it. We have time for one final question. Yes. And I'd love to love for you to tell us someone just getting started in the industry, just learning technical analysis, all these other disciplines, what advice would you give them or, or what would you tell a younger you trying to figure all of this out? You got to do your homework. Mm. I mean, I think the Almanac's a great place to start, but yeah. read the newspapers. Mm. Read, I mean, the IBD isn't out there as much as it used to be, but read the journal. Sure. Read Barron's. Yeah. Um, it's all available online. Do some reading and then, you know, follow a stock. Yeah. And you just got to look at some charts. Go to a CMT meeting. Yep. That's see right. what goes on. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> It's a humbling game that and we're all trying to play. And learn from your mistakes, it? man. Yeah. And, and keep tr and write things down. That's probably the most mm. important thing. Yeah. That's what we do. Got to space and write stuff down. Make yeah. notes. So it's funny. So I, and again, thanks so much for doing this. I, my stock charts colleagues will tell you I have the stock traders almanac right next to my monitor. I've been doing that for years, and still make notes about things I'm seeing and everything because that's I, I I've mean, got all my old ones saved I on take, there. That's the place to do it. That's it. I love to see them. I take stuff yeah. to memory pretty well when I write it down with a pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. You know, it still works. works that way. This was such a pleasure, Jeff. Thanks hey, so man, much for giving us some time. Great to hear you have the Almanac. Good luck to you. Uh, congrats on the Almanac just thanks. coming out for next year. Good Appreciate luck with, uh, with everything you're doing. Thanks, man. Everyone, thanks, uh, Jeff Hurst, for joining us today from the Las Vegas Traders Expo. So that was my conversation with Jeff Hirsch. And again, Jeff is uh, a fascinating guy to talk with. I love how he combines all those different disciplines. And when we particularly got into the modeling of technical versus fundamental versus geopolitical and how you sort of you know, wrap those all together. I thought was really, really interesting. But if there's one takeaway, I hope that resonates with you. I've, I've worked with a lot of people who think about cycles, especially seasonal trends. And we're at that point of the year where people start talking about it. You talk about in, in May, when it's sell in May and go away and, and how May to November is seasonally weakest part of the year. Then it happens again right about now in November because November to May ends up being the seasonally strongest part of the year. So in general, markets tend to do well between November and May and they tend to do less good on average from May to November. Um, so twice a year and, and also year end, you've got the January effect, the Santa Claus rally, all the different things that, that people talk about sort of seasonal trends going into the year end. But if you call what Jeff and I talked about, it was how seasonality does not occur in a vacuum. He would never just sell in May and go away based on the fact that it's May. There is a trend following component to what they do with the Stock Traders Almanac, particularly his newsletter, also with the way that they use to manage live money. So don't forget that just because it's May or just because it's November, that is not a signal on its own. It's all about the trends around those seasonal signals. That's the real valuable part of seasonality as part of a holistic system. We're gonna take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Julius DeKempener talking about RRG.
Okay, welcome back. This is your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every day here on the final bar. I uh, wanted to share with you a quick presentation, uh, talking technically segment from my colleague, Julius de Kempner. Julius is based in Amsterdam. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not an unfamiliar face and name to many of you. He is the creator of the RRG methodology, the relative rotation graphs. I've known Julius for years. I, I worked with him um, and was a client of his when he was at a broker um, in, uh, in a European broker and uh, learned his relative rotation methodology, started to incorporate it. I thought it was a fantastic way, and I still do. One of the best ways I've ever seen to visualize rotation, to visualize how assets are rotating around a benchmark. Now, I tend to think of it as the 11 S&P sectors or the industry groups rotating around the S&P, but it can also be used for a lot of other asset classes. So let's hear from Julius DeKempener on how to construct RRG for various asset classes. Here we go. Running an RRG for various asset classes is actually very simple on stockcharts.com. If we start off the basic RRG, as a member, you will see various selection options. You can put in your own symbols, you can put in your own benchmark, but there is also a number of predefined groups. If you go into that group drop down selection, you will find a line that says asset allocation. If you select that, the RRG will update to a number of asset classes on the screen. They vary from equities to government bonds to high yield bonds and you will actually be able to see the rotation of those asset classes against a benchmark. In this case we're using VBINX which is a Vanguard balanced index fund but quite frankly you can stick in any benchmark that you would like to use for your particular reason. Also, if you would like to alter our selection of asset classes, simply go into the symbols box and add anything you like. Suppose you would like to add the Dow Jones Industrials Index as an equity component, then you just add dollar INDU in that box, hit update, and you will get asset allocation with the Dow Jones Industrials and the S&P 500. It's very easy to change anything you like. So that was Julius de Kempener on relative rotation graphs. And again, if you haven't checked it out on stock charts, do yourself a favor, you know, look into it. And again, if you look at the preset groups, there are a bunch of different things to look at. Sectors, industries, stocks, looking at sector constituents, asset classes, a lot of different ways. And again, I've found it's not always the answer, but it helps you figure out the questions you should be asking. It helps point you to the right charts that you should be paying attention to. That is our show for today, Thursday, November 14th. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to be back live tomorrow on Friday with the show wrapping the week. We look forward to sharing with you what the charts are saying on the long-term basis. Please keep your questions and your feedback coming. The final bar at stockcharts.com is the best way to get a hold of us. For stockcharts.com, this is Dave Keller. Have a great night.